Hi everyone, I'm Renee. For those of you that have watched a couple of my videos, you might have remembered this table project and the plant that was on this table when I sat here and did a video. Uh, I think it was like short books in September or something like that. Maybe the thumbnail has this table in it, but I took this table from downstairs, which was really in weird condition. It was just wood, wood unfinished, and I painted it red. I actually think it needs another coat and some gloss or something over it. But I had a plant, it was kind of like a palm, not a palm, mm, I don't know what it was, but it was big and I had spray painted the planter, which was so cool for this table. Uh, I spray painted it beige. The plant is doing fine. It's alive and well. It just happens to be down in the dining room where we have all the light because I only have this bedroom window uh, coming, light coming in from it, and I thought it would do all right and it didn't. Yeah, so this plant here now has done well. I like to get plants from the clearance section of like Home Depot or something and try to give them a second life. And this one, you can tell it's reaching for the light, but it was doing that when it was over here too, and it was much, it's much darker. So welcome in this is a, a reading update from a very slumpy week or so of mine and we'll get into it all right let's get into it i have a couple books here to talk about that i've read and a few books that i tried to read and i couldn't get into but i think they're definitely worth mentioning because they may be for you i have been like in a real reading slump. It happens to all of us. I have a very frenetic mind right now. I'm in a very busy time at work and I also haven't been feeling well. And when I have a frenetic brain, it makes settling down or not settling down, but it makes a connecting with a book difficult. And I will probably cycle through more books than I usually do and even ones that normally I would connect with I'm just not connecting with. Um, as it turns out I had a I wasn't feeling well and I started to have a toothache despite having just been at the dentist and so I'm now on antibiotics I have a root canal in a couple weeks after it's settled down and not hurting anymore so I'm on the track so let's get to it. I saw this listed somewhere as a new release and it's a collection of memoirs on loneliness called The Loneliness Files by Athena Dixon. This is done by Tin House, which is a publishing company. Uh, the Grim Reader just mentioned this on one of her recent videos, uh, Tin House, and um, there's a podcast put out by Tin House called Between the Covers. The host is David Naiman, and I'm telling you, if you're at all listening to book podcasts, this is one for you to check out, so I'll, I'll link that. But, um, you know, like any essay collection, especially essays even more so than short stories, I connected with some of the stories they all have the uh, of course the theme of loneliness and uh, yeah so this was um it's definitely worth checking out uh, one of the things she says in the very first story called say you will remember me is that being alone is a choice alone seems like a choice loneliness doesn't so she's making a distinct uh, she's drawing a distinct difference between being alone and loneliness and how loneliness is cropping up for her at the point she's writing the book. Some of it is during the pandemic and then it just broadens out into different things that she ends up thinking about. And one of them is a story, a really sad story of a woman named Joyce Carol Vincent who uh, died 
apparently in front of her TV and wasn't found until, oh my gosh, I don't know how much later, like a really awful time later. And so she's, because she's in this loneliness track, she's thinking about all these things. But yeah, I really, I really liked the writing. I think this is her first book. I finally, this is before, this is really before my reading slump became full on. But I picked up this Atesha, Atesha, Atessa Mott because I thought if any of them, this would be the one I connected with. I've tried a couple of them. I have not tried Eileen, which I'll get to at some point in my lifetime. But for all intents and purposes, I did, I did really enjoy this book. I really enjoyed the beginning. I was like hooked. It's a, uh, it's a mystery. The woman who's a widow and lives in the country, in the, not the countryside, the woods, uh, has moved to a small place in the woods that used to be a camp, um, finds a mysterious note. This is how the story actually opens. Sentence one, her name was Magda. Nobody will ever know who, who killed her. It wasn't me. Here is her dead body. So our narrator comes across, she, is she named? Our narrator comes across this note just lying on the forest floor as she's going on a walk like she always does in the woods with her dog, Charlie. And she's thinking like somebody left a note on a dead body. I can't see where the dead body is, but there's a murderer amidst, in our midst. And um, so she's elderly like she's older she's 70 or something I think it says here how old she is but um, she's bereft her dog Charlie I think that she's gotten since her husband died Walter I think is her husband uh, is her companion and he is um, such a big part of the story um, and um, the widow goes about trying to solve this mystery as she's in and around town. She even goes so far as like writing a note back and she wants to leave it in the woods. I was just, I was all over the story. The writing is wonderful. I was finally able to experience Otessa Moshveg's writing. So that was one of the real goals of this book. I just didn't like the ending. What do people think about the ending? Without giving it away in the comments, if you've read this book, what are you thinking about the ending? I didn't like it. It almost, it, almost, it, it just, it, uh, um, yeah. I'll converse back if you talk about it in the comments, but I, I just felt like it wasn't, wasn't the way that I wanted it to end. Uh, but I'm not writing the book, so I don't get to choose it. Um, yeah, I don't like what happens to one of the two characters in the end. Somebody or something gets hurt. Let me just put it that way. That's disappointing. That was my real disappointment. And you know, I wanted to know more. I just wanted to know more. It's entirely up to her to end the book this way. I get it, but that's just my total experience of this book. Then, oh my gosh, what a real treat. Am I missing something? Oh yeah, I am. Uh, I'll grab it in a second. What a real slump buster this thing is. It's called Someone Who Will Love You in All Your Damaged Glory by Raphael Bob Waxberg creator of BoJack Horseman. The, um, is it a cartoon? An adult cartoon? I don't know what those shows are really called. I heard about this book from Oliver of the Chaotic Bibliophile, whose channel I will list below because do yourself a favor and start listening to Oliver's recommendations. This is short stories and it's all over the place. They're not connected at all. A fabulously offbeat collection of short stories about love, the best and worst thing in 
the universe. This was actually laugh out loud funny because of its like scattered nature. You never knew what kind of story you were going to come across next. Look how the writing of the first one starts really large and then it goes and then it goes down. This one is funny though because the very first one, the subject of the story is salted cashew nuts, but not just salted cashews, salted circus cashews, which is a can of nuts that this young lady is given when she goes to this guy's apartment. They like each other. She goes to the apartment. He offers her a snack and it's saltus, salted circus cashews. And the fun of this two page story is the thing that's listed on the can. And that's what this entire page is, is the thing listed on the can. And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller. The salted circus cashews are waiting. They are so savory and delicious. You will be so glad you put your faith in me. This time is different. I promise you it's different. Why would I lie to you? Why would I want to hurt you? This time there is no snake waiting. This time things are going to be wonderful. So that really reminded me of those like trick cans that you would open and like this fabric snake would come out of it with a spring. And then there's just, you know, there's just stories like this with a lot of space. This was the slump buster for me. I had such a good time. Not all the time would I be in the mood for this kind of book. Like this really got it for me. So chuckles abounded. Then this is a book that I tried and it's just not a book that I'm in the mood to keep going on, but I really thought this was interesting. And on another day, another week, another time, I would be reading this. It is Jonathan Lethen's Brooklyn crime novel. You're probably going to see this talked about on booktube in different places. Um, Sarah from Hardcover Hearts just talked about this in one of her videos. So I'll link her channel as one of her weekly reads videos. And I liked the choppiness of the writing. It's written in these numbered paragraphs. I bailed on it pretty quickly, so I'm not the person to tell you what it's about. I will let Sarah do the talking on that one. And, and then I did from the library get two Helen Garner holds. The other one's over there, but I'll just tell you about it because I have one of them here. So Helen Garner is still alive and I didn't know that. I didn't know who she was because there are two books that have just been reprinted by, I don't know what, I will look that up in a sense, but reprinted. This is called This House of Grief and the other one is The Children's Bach, B-A-C-H. It's a really thin book. This is the story of a murder trial. These are republished. They, um, I think Children's Bach is from the 70s or 80s. And this one must have been, yeah, this is about a true and very sad story that happened on September 4th, 2005. It's a true crime classic for one of Australia's most acclaimed writers. Um, it's a story about a, a guy named Robert Farkasharson. He was driving his three young sons back to their mother from whom he had been separated. Suddenly his car veered off the road and plunged into a dam. He survived the crash. The boys did not. There's a whole trial and it's outlined in this story. Children's Bach is fiction. It's very light. I'm just starting it. It's about a couple who then get reacquainted with the husband's college, close college friend. And there's a whole band of other people that come along with that college friend. It seems fine. I don't know. I like her fiction voice. It's very, right now it's all very like scattered and just spitting things out. And we'll see how it all, we'll see if it comes together. I don't know. So I'll put a thumbnail of that up here, but it's based on the same type of cover. Let me know if you're a Helen Garner fan and what you've read. Anyone that's read this book, uh, this particular book, I would be interested to hear 
about. I probably won't read it just because it's thicker than I thought and I'm reading the other one. But that's all I have. Let me check. What am I? Oh, I am reading. Um, I don't have it here, but I'll just tell you. I um, am back to reading Trollope. I am back to reading the next book in the Barsetshire series, which is The Small House at Allington. Because of the slump, I just wanted to have this dependable, enjoyable book by an author that I knew ready and waiting for me. And that's why I grabbed The Small House at Allington because I had started it and then I put it aside. I needed a break from Trollope. And now he's back and I'm loving it. And I just, you know, read a couple pages a night. It's a very slow read, these books for me. And I'm just so enjoying it. Um, it's October and in booktube world some people read Victorian novels. It's called Victober on booktube and um, so that's really fun. I'm not specifically reading Trollope for that but because these books are written in the 1860s and 70s it falls into Victorian times. There's a fairly new booktuber named Joe Spivey who, if I'm pronouncing his last name right, who is fully embracing Victober and has just talked about a tennis, Tennyson poem. He's also reading Trollope and what else? Check his channel out. I'll list it below. Oh, I think he read um, Herman Melville, uh, Moby Dick, I think. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's been fun. It's been fun following him in his Victober reads. Hi there, part two. I wanted to add to this reading update. It's about a week or so later, but I've read some more books since then. <clears throat> and on the subject of not feeling well, I mentioned in the other clip about the dental infection, <laughs> but then I, I caught something like a mild upper respiratory thing. So there's that. Not helping, of course, the reading slump that I was in. Just frenetic mind because of work and then not feeling well just makes it harder, doesn't it? To pick a book. Your concentration isn't the same. What I did pick up that I actually did not think would stick, but this was a book that I have at least heard about from Biblio Sophie. I'll, I'll uh, link her channel in the notes. It's the, it says winner of the Man Booker Prize. Now, before I turned the video on, I didn't check to see if this was the book from Julian Barnes that won, but I have to assume that it is. Why is the egg on the front? Anybody that's read this book, I'm trying to figure it out. Is it because the book starts when the main character is young and then goes through until they're older. I loved the experience of this book while I was in it and now I'm struggling to remember what it was about. But I did enjoy it. I did. Let's see. I, I think that goes more towards the kind of weeks that I'm having at work. This is a extremely busy time of year than anything. One of the things that it's that the back of this book says is Evelyn Waugh did it in Brideshead Revisited, as did Philip Larkin in Jill and Kazuo Ishiguro in The Remains of the Day. Now, with this powerfully compact new novel, Julian Barnes takes his place among the subtly assertive practitioners of this quiet art. And does this quiet art mean just talking about a life? I think so. I think so. The thing, the reason I didn't think I was going to get on with this book is that it starts off with the narrator talking about his school days, like primary school or middle school, and like when they were young teenagers and his friend group, and how this um, boy comes to their class uh, who's moved into the area named Adrian and how different Adrian was from the rest of his friends, the uniqueness of Adrian. And I didn't know how long it was going to take the story to get into present day. I, I am not totally drawn in by a story that is 
about childhood, but I mean, I'm hypocritical in that because I've recently read some that have really stuck. So that was like my main thing. I didn't know if I was going to stick with it because I, I didn't know how long he would be in his younger years, but it, it's, it's not that long. And it, it's there to set the stage about his friend group and especially his friendship with Adrian. And this book talks a lot about the way that our friendships change over the years, but it does it in a, in a very beautiful and eloquent and well-written way. He really susses out how when our lives change and we try to stay in touch, what makes us not stay in touch what happens with like a group of four friends maybe if a couple of the friends live near each other or they have more in common they're going to be closer than you are to those um childhood friends and especially if you end up going to different universities if that's what you do after school really interesting i really liked that part and then the book focuses more on adrian and because Adrian comes back into his life in an interesting way. And this also talks about young romantic relationships. And I really liked how he, he, Julian Barnes talks about this or how his character talks about this and how he eventually marries someone that's not his, his uh, early romance. Um, but I, did enjoy it. I got a little confused at the end about some other people tangential to Adrian um, came in, Adrian and, and also his first romantic love, uh, but I'm just going to chalk that up to my confused brain. Now I want to know where do I go next with this Julian Barnes. Uh, also, this written like a memoir. I just kept forgetting that I was reading uh, a fiction book. But where do I go next? I don't know anything about Julian Barnes, so I, I will take some recommendations. All right, so that one. Then I started from the library, I started this newly, new book, newly published book called Loved and Missed by Susie Boyd. And I know I saw this in the New Yorker or the New York Times or something. And I was like completely drawn in by the cover and the description of the story. And then I think I read a little bit of it on Lit Hub. Uh, they have samples of some of the new releases. And I was just so mesmerized by the painting that uh, New Directions? No, New York Review Books, NYRB. Yeah, this is interesting. This is like a fat, like a, a wider, larger version of the NYRB that they did. It's not the normal size, I don't think, or at least the font is larger. It just feels wider than normal. But I had trouble with this at first because this is about um, a woman who has a daughter who is... I think a drug addict and is fallen in with just a lifestyle that's really hard for her to um, imagine her the mother and sh her daughter has a very unstable life her name is Eleanor the daughter and um, her daughter is uh, pregnant and has a child and so the rest of the story is about Lily uh, Eleanor's child and how Eleanor's mother has to care for the child. That's such a simplistic way of talking about this book. It's really a, talking about the internal experience of the mother. Let me find out what, her, oh, Ruth, yeah. Of Ruth and the heartbreak, the heartbreak of worrying about her daughter all the time and trying to manage the relationship without shutting her daughter out. And then the complicated factor of taking care of Lily and not wanting to uh, leave out Eleanor. It's a, it's a dance. It's a dance that she's doing every day. This really, it was hard for me to read about her heartbreak, uh, probably because of my mind and because of not feeling well. I didn't feel like I was up for 
the emotional impact of this book. Like it's, it, it is impactful. And uh, so I ended up just reading a tiny bit every day in the morning when I was doing the War and Peace reading that I do, the chapter a day. And I, I was able to just keep going with the book. And I'm really glad because it's, it's got like, I put these little removable tabs on this library book because the writing is crazy. I mean, crazy good, crazy good. And now I'm like, I need to explore Susie Boyd. So just like Julian Barnes, are there any Susie Boyd fans watching this? Please let me know where I should go next with Susie Boyd um, or if I should just pick one and go. Let's see. I want to know what the name of this painting is on the front. Cover art, Chantal Joffe, Train to Vermont 2020. Let me just read some of the passages here. So she's wanting to try and softly negotiate with Eleanor about the care of Lily. And but she's raging inside sometimes about the situation with Eleanor and wishing she could have some kind of impact on it. I felt arrows of rage rising in me, fraught images spreading like bloodstains. There's no point, I told myself. It won't get you anywhere. Think of the outcome. Think of the outcome you want and make sure you are moving toward it. Got to be practical. There is so much in life that doesn't matter. So many things that hold you back, hem you in and throw you off the scent of what's important. Don't get too bogged down in the things that don't count or things you can't influence. And specifically, don't worry too much about making sure others know you're in the right. I had to be quite stoic when I was with Eleanor. If I looked in any way aggrieved, she wouldn't speak. But I forgot in my panic that seeing me spritz myself all over with false brightness disgusted her a little bit also. She hated everything resembling dishonesty or performance, but if I faced her truthfully, she would probably never see me again. Just that complicated dance with someone who is living an unfortunately unstable life that you want to keep in your life. This is the kind of gut-wrenching stuff, but so beautifully written. So I'm, I'm really glad I read this. I don't want to spoil anything for you. It's at once a gentle and love-filled story with this heartbreaking pain. I can't recommend this enough, but you have to be in the right headspace. Really glad that I discovered Susan Boyd. And then I found a gentle book. It's a Barbara Pym. I went to the library. I uh, picked out the Barbara Pym that was there that I hadn't read. And I love this one no fond return of love it's such an easy premise to slip into oh my goodness dulcy mainwaring she's like a some kind of indexer of sorts in the literary world and she goes to she's broken up uh, or her fiance has broken up with her i think this was written in the 70s and she goes to a literary conference. She sees this famous guy named Elwin something. And she also makes friends at this conference. She's living in a house that her mother, her parents have left her. They've died. And she, these, one of these friends, Viola or Viola, has come to be her roommate because uh, Viola had to move out of her apartment. So like, she gets real dividends from going to this conference that she wasn't sure she wanted to go to. She also sees this good looking guy named Aylwin, and it just so happens that Viola had had a relationship with him. He's married. And I don't know where the story is going, but it's such a delightful place to be, like any Barbara Pym really that I've ever read. So this was like just really great balm for my mind right now. I'm also reading we have always lived in the castle. So I'll talk about that more. It's my first Shirley Jackson. I guess it was the last book she ever read. And it's got a really great blurb on it from Donna Tart that I just saw last night. Uh, so I'll talk more about that later. 
But to wrap it up, I just found something. I just thought this was funny. Uh, my birthday is coming up at the end of October and I'm a Scorpio. And for anybody that is all is a uh, horoscope familiar, mm. I just happened to see on my library's website, they, they have this new database called Biblio Commons. Uh, that they went to and they have all kinds of cute things on the front page it wasn't there before and one of them i just happened to see this little thing that said zodiac reads scorpio season and um so for all you scorpios out there uh i know probably non-scorpios are not interested in this so skip ahead scorpio a water sign associated with secrets and guarded feelings keepers of grudges invested in the mysterious, deeply emotional, but they, but they don't want you to know that. Maybe they're just highly selective with who they spend their time with and how their time is used. <laughs> oh my God. I don't think I'm a keeper of grudges. I will say that. But some of the book recommendations they make are so cute. Well, of course, one of them is The Secret History, which is dead on right. And the other is, let's see, The Bell Jar, which I totally agree with. And I have to reread that. I was like, it was decades ago, like decades ago that I read that. A book called Vengeance by Zane. Scorpios are known for being passionate and Zane is the expert in that field. Her books are spicy with characters who know all about deceit and secrets. Uh, another one called Your House Will Pay. It's a thriller set in 1992 Los Angeles by Steph Cha. Oh, there's a Kurt Vonnegut in here. If this isn't nice, what is? So this really introduced me to this Kurt Vonnegut book. The graduation speeches and other words to live by. The optimistic cynic and fellow Scorpio Kurt Vonnegut collects his graduation speeches and other words to live by. That's really cool. I want to check that out. I have yet to read a Kurt Vonnegut, but I do want to read one. And uh, the, the last one I'll mention is a book called The Other Black Girl by uh, Zakaya Dahlia Harris. It came out in 2021. And this reminds me, I actually have this on audiobook and I started listening to it over the summer and I never finished it. I guess I had um, some points to use on Audible, uh, but I like the voice in this audiobook, by the way, so check that out. It says, Scorpios are driven to succeed at all costs, <laughs> and they're good at reading people. So this is about Nella Rogers, and at the time that the story opens, she is the only black woman in this, I think it's publishers, a publisher, and she's like an editor's assistant or something. And then um, another black woman joins the company, Hazel, and um, she's, shares, she shares the cubicle wall with Nella. Nella's excited, like, oh, cool. Like, we'll talk about all kinds of things that we have in common. And then Hazel becomes the office darling and leaves Nella in the dust. But there's something else that happens too. Like, that's the simple premise, but then it, it uh, it goes on from there, but I really liked the voice. It just has reminded me to get back to it. So thanks for indulging me down the Scorpio rabbit hole. Thanks for joining me. I really look forward to your comments about anything I've talked about here. I hope all of you are having a wonderful end of October. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next one.